Now we turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, where Jesus speaks about being the Good Shepherd. Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I've told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. Father and I are one. God, we ask for your blessings on the reading of Scripture today. May it bring insight to us all. May it be inspiring for us to understand your ways. And Lord, give us the courage and faith to live it out as well as we can. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Words. Words are for expressing, conveying, and communication. Words are symbols. Words are certain sounds we make with our voices, or they are particular squiggly lines on paper, parchment, or stone. These sounds and squiggly lines represent ideas. Now now stay with me on this, okay? One person takes an emotion that he or she has, formulates it into images and ideas in his or her mind, produces the corresponding symbolic sound or squiggly lines, and someone else hears a certain sound or sees the particular squiggly lines, and they produce ideas and images in in that person's mind from their catalog of experience, and they experience an emotional response connected to what they understood the other person to be saying. And as we all well know, that process does not work well all the time. Communication is one person trying to get another person to empathize or at least sympathize with them. Today, like every Sunday in Bible study, we are trying to understand and perhaps experience with empathy and sympathy what someone thousands of years ago experienced in relation to God. It is my hope that you do not just hear certain sounds or see particular squiggly lines that will show up on the screen, but that you will put together ideas and images in your mind which elicit an emotional response, and that you also experience God. Let's see how well I do today. Once again, sending out certain sounds coming from the particular squiggly lines that we find in the Bible. Some words in scripture can be inspiring. First chapter in Genesis, for example, 
describing the beginning of the creation of the world. We read about God's spirit blowing across the waters of chaos and ordering the universe. We read of God's awesome power to create and to order when God simply speaks words and what God says just happens, beginning with the creation of light and ending with the creation of human beings. And as we read the words describing the origin of all things, we also resonate with the awe of our own creation. The story of the creation of the universe is also our individual story. We may read the words and understand the definition of the words, but what we experience is more than just intellectual knowledge. We become a part of the story in an emotional way. Now some words in scriptures can be challenging. We want to please God by doing what God wants us to do. For example, let's see, oh, but sometimes what God wants us to do is very difficult. For example, Jesus calls upon us to love our enemies. Now you understand the picture. Love your enemies. It is not very hard to love your family and friends, or at least most of the time it's not. But it is another thing to love those who do not wish you well and may even try to hurt us. We can take away some of the harshness when we realize that Jesus is calling upon us to hold an attitude toward our enemies which seeks their well-being, their health, and true happiness. Jesus doesn't call upon us you know, to feel warm and fuzzy about our enemies. He calls upon us to have a disposition of mind which seeks to be positive rather than combative against our enemies, uh, which seeks to be reconciling, and which seeks to be constructive to life rather than destructive. All of this is difficult when the other person is negative, combative, and destructive toward you. This passage and others challenges us to be better behaving human beings than those around us and what we have been ourselves in the past. To do so, we must take Jesus' words and then make them into our state of mind and put them into our actions. We must move beyond mere words and experience for ourselves the true meaning of those words in our lives. Now one of the best scriptures to begin this process is Psalm 23. The 23rd Psalm has been a favorite of Jews and Christians alike for thousands of years. It is only six verses long, but they are very powerful six verses. Many people have committed the words of the 23rd Psalm to memory and can recite them by rote. When I visit people in nursing homes, there are usually two things that they have committed to memory and they are one of the last things that they ever forget, the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. What is it about the 23rd Psalm that makes it so prevalent and important to so many people? Well, let's take a look, let's take a listen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long or forever. Most of us call Psalm 23 the shepherd's psalm, but it is really a psalm for the sheep. It really ought to be called the sheep's Psalm. And of course, we are the sheep. Please don't take offense at that identification. The psalm talks about God being our shepherd and shepherds, well, they tend sheep. Now, in ancient times, kings were referred to as the shepherd of the people whom they ruled over. But kings borrowed the image from actual shepherds tending their sheep. 
But while kings and monarchs have failed, often failed, to provide peace and prosperity for their people, God leads us to lack nothing that we need. With God as our shepherd, we are not in want of anything. God has provided us with a world which can be rich in everything we need. If we treat the earth with respect and gratitude and do not abuse it, that is. The earth can provide all we need to physically satisfy us. And God's shepherding spirit can provide all that we need emotionally and spiritually. Therefore, we can be and have peace of mind and soul. This fulfillment of our needs and being at peace is represented by describing actual sheep resting in pastures that are covered in green grass. The sheep have all the food that they could ever want. Our shepherd God leads us beside still waters so that there is plenty to satisfy our spiritual thirst. But more than that, the waters are quiet so that there is no danger being swept away and drown. There is plenty and safety with God, so our shepherd God restores our souls. The Hebrew word translated as soul is nephesh, which literally means life force. God restores or replenishes our life force. God gives us life when we are born, and God makes us alive as we connect with God. God is the source of all life. God has the energy of life. And when we connect with God, we connect with the power source of life itself. And when we follow our shepherd God's commands on how to live our lives, we not only give glory to God's name by respecting God's authority as our shepherd, but we find our lives are more fulfilled and thus our life force is strengthened. So God leads us in the right path for God's name's sake. If we are describing actual sheep, the shepherd leads the sheep on pathways that are safe and have plenty of food and water. But even on the safest and plentiful paths, there will be dark valleys to pass through. For actual sheep, these dark valleys are the places where predator animals may be waiting to prey upon them from the shadows or their footing may not be so stable and I can't see it. For we humans, these dark valleys are the places and times in our lives when we are not safe and we are vulnerable to harm. It could be times upon losing a job and facing an uncertain financial future. Or it could be losing someone we love and facing an uncertain future without this important person in our lives. Or it could be the loss of faith and the road ahead of us in life seems dark with little or no meaning. For we humans, the dark valleys are more spiritual. But even in the dark valleys of life, our shepherd God is there with us to help us find our way through and to protect us from the predators and the downfalls that lurk there. A shepherd protects the sheep with a staff and, and a club or a rod to fend off animals and to pull the sheep from places that they cannot free themselves. Likewise, God has a figurative staff and a club to protect us from despair and cynicism. Then in verse 5, we leave the sheep images behind and the psalm speaks of people. But there are people who are receiving God's protection and bountiful providence. The psalmist writes that being close to God is like being completely safe in the presence of one's enemies as one eats a banquet of food and drink. Like an honored guest at a feast, God anoints our heads with oil. And God provides so much of what we need, it is like a cup that continually overflows. God's blessings are always overflowing. Then we come to the final verse in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The blessings of God are not just for a moment or just for a time in our lives. God's blessings of goodness and mercy or loving kindness follow us throughout our lives.
But God's goodness and loving kindness do not just follow after us, trying to catch up with us. The word is better translated as pursue. Goodness and loving kindness will pursue us all the days of our lives. God's blessings of goodness and mercy do not just tag along, trying to reach out to us behind us. No, God's goodness and mercy chase after us. They hound us and they hunt us down. And if we are receptive, God's goodness and mercy overtake us and tackle us like a linebacker sacking a quarterback or a guard dog taking down an intruder. But instead of trying to hurt us, God, God wants to give us goodness and to pour mercy and loving kindness into our cup. And when we allow God's goodness and mercy to overtake us and to tackle us, we are assured that we will live in God's house for our entire lives, both here on earth and in the world beyond, meaning forever. For most people, the words of the 23rd Psalm produce ideas and images in our minds that evoke in us feelings of safety and comfort. Genesis chapter 1 may evoke in us inspiration at the grandeur of the universe. Jesus' words to love our enemies may invoke in us an, a disquiet and an ill at ease which challenges us to go beyond our comfort. But Psalm 23 invokes in us an experience of calm and quiet and fulfillment. It is like when psychologists ask us to envision a place where we feel safe and comfortable. We find a place within our minds of peace and quiet, much like the eye of a storm or maybe a tropical beach. But the 23rd Psalm is not just some place in our minds like a tropical beach or a mountain lake or whatever it is that you think is comforting. Psalm 23 provides images which even we modern urban dwelling people can empathize and about and be satisfied with safe sheep. Psalm 23 speaks of our spiritual experience of God's protection and providence. Our souls are safe in God's care, and God provides our souls with life and nourishment so that we may live abundantly in the spirit. Psalm 23 guides us to an experience of calm and comfort which transcend earthly concerns and dangers to give us the assurance of knowing feelings of safety and fulfillment forever. Psalm 23 can take us beyond its words to know God's goodness and loving kindness deep within our souls. Amen.